If you are sensitive to the effects of the full moon, my friend, then this video is for you. This is going to be what I call an energy update, an intuitive reading of the particular energy inherent in this full moon, the one on April 23rd, 2024, which is both powerful and very, very unique. It will bring you inward and shine a light, you could say, into some of the ways you tick and operate, some of your patterns, habit, where do they come from? You might find out. You might find a way to finally break through and transcend them. This full moon is very forward moving. It's encouraging you to really step into your power and your potential and embody your true essence in this life, in this chapter right now of your life. The full moon is going to help you in a myriad of different ways. But as you know, it's not always easy functioning in this energy. You might feel kind of stressed. You might feel some of your emo a lot of your emotions up at the surface, making it difficult to stay calm and centered and grounded. And yet in this sort of atmosphere is where you can learn, is where you can finally start thinking and seeing things from other perspective and thinking outside of the box and discovering new aspects of yourself, new opportunities right there for you in your life from this type of energy. So the reason I make these videos is, again, because it's not always easy to function in this type of energy. And also, as you may have seen, every full moon has its own flavor, has its own theme, has its own lessons, has its own challenges, has its own opportunities. And today, again, I'm going to share with you five things I really think you should know about this particular full moon happening April 23rd, 2024. Theme number one, this full moon is shining a light on our irrational fears. You might start to become aware that you are sort of navigating your life, making important decisions, maybe avoiding doing things that you want to do or feel called to do or continue doing things you don't need to be doing at all, but because of these irrational, previously unconscious fears, you've been doing so. And when we're run, when we live life from this fear, of course it's a mess. We, we, can't ever find, we can't ever seem to find balance in our life. We can't ever seem to sustain happiness. And even when things are going well on paper, we feel, we know something's missing because we can't really allow ourselves to enjoy it because we don't want it to be taken away. And anyway, this fear energy, when it comes up, it can feel very big, very like, <clears throat> excuse me, formidable, like, holy cow, what's, what's going to happen? But the cool thing about this full moon is you will be able to look uh, maybe a bit deeper into the fear and see just how silly it is. A lot of our fears, when you really bring it to light and even like discuss it or write about it or something, it's like, it's like, really? Am I really afraid of this? Reminds me of my, my, I have a funny story about my son, Sebastian. He's eight years old now, but when he was like three or four years old, one time I saw him sitting at the bottom of our steps to, and his room is, was upstairs. And I was like, what are you doing, Bash? I, what, what's going on, buddy? He said, well, I want to go upstairs to get my toy, but I'm afraid. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what are you afraid of? <laughs> he, in a very serious tone, he goes, dinosaurs. <laughs> and I was like, really? You're, you're actually afraid? You're actually, son, afraid of dinosaurs? And he was. And that sounds, of course, silly. But a lot of your fears, a lot of my fears, are no less irrational than my son Sebastian's fear of dinosaurs. I had a dream just last night that really painted a good picture. I've been going through a phase lately, for, the, for those of you who care, um, where I've picked up the guitar and, like, for the first time, and I absolutely love it. I've been playing the guitar for hours a day. And I had this dream last night, basically, where this, this psychic we know, who's really awesome, actually, she was saying your whole house, she predicted like, she was like in the dream, she's like, your whole house is likely going to just collapse into the earth 
because the earth is shifting and it's going to just basically become like engulfed by the earth. <laughs> and in the dream, I was playing guitar previously and I woke up thinking about that, trying to like put it all together. And I realized, I, and it's true, I have this fear if I play too much, if I have too much fun, if I play too much guitar, my whole reality is in jeopardy, which of course is stupid. It's a, it's a ridiculous fear, but it's like this, it's just, there's this energy in my body that comes up as I play guitar or, or I've been playing guitar too long. And my dream, luckily, and I believe, oh, I don't know about you, but my dreams are oftentimes enhanced, influenced, made more clear by the full moon. So it's like, oh, I really don't have anything to worry about. I can play guitar all freaking day and the house ain't gonna collapse. I know that. So what about you, my friend? What has been concerning you? I invite you to take a deeper look and you might not even want to because sometimes these irrational fears are kind of guarded by the, the, just like this big energy of fear and oftentimes we just, we, we get close to it, we, we, we shy away. Um, but whether you want to or not, I encourage you to do so willingly. It's easier that way. But if not, I suspect life will be showing you clues as to the true origin or the, 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 the silly quality maybe of a lot of your fears. And what a blessing. What a blessing. So many people are literally like completely controlled and held down by their irrational fears. And you, my friend, have an opportunity to look them dead in the eye and see them for what they really are. And imagine the implications. Imagine you going through life, say, starting tomorrow, not held back by fear. Imagine if all the inspirations you, you get spontaneously on any given day, you just go for it. You don't think too much about it. You don't question it. You don't concern yourself about it. You don't tell your friends about your concerns. You just freaking do it without even thinking twice. That's the type of freedom of flow and movement you can have. It's kind of like my friend Aaron. He did this, uh, my buddy Aaron Dowdy, he's a YouTuber. And he did a, a talk yesterday for this big, this big event and he was like a guest speaker. And he was, you know, he gets in his head all the time. I've, I've mentioned it before. He gets, he kind of gets, he gets, you know, afraid essentially. And I was telling him, I'm like, bro, what are you actually afraid of? I'm like, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of like not knowing what to do? It's like I, I, I brought to his attention, like you've probably made two, 3,000 YouTube videos, given dozens and dozens of live talks. Are you actually afraid you're not going to know what to do? And he's like, no. And I'm, I, I gave him the analogy. I'm like, you going and giving a talk is like brushing your teeth. Like for you folks, do you ever concern yourself that you're not going to brush your teeth correctly? Do you really think about it? No, you just freaking do it. You just do it without thinking. Imagine if you pursued your dreams the same way you pursue brushing your teeth, hopefully every morning. Just think about how much faster. What, what could you accomplish? If there wasn't this one foot forward, two steps back, getting stuck, overanalyzing the situation to death and to the point where it's like the opportunity fades away into nothing. No, you just go. You allow that light of your spirit to, to flow you forward freely, like a powerful gushing river, not held back by anything from within. That's the opportunity we're talking here, my friend. It's also a fantastic time to manifest abundance. And I don't even like to use that word because to me it sounds so, so I don't know, I have my opinions on it, obviously. Um, it sounds like uh, entitled almost. Like, I'm just going to manifest abundance um, without doing the work. But there are, there, there are times and there is some truth to this in my opinion when I'm learning. In fact, there's this book I'm reading. It's really cool. It's called The Abundance Book. It's a real little book by uh, John Randolph uh, Price, if you're interested. And basically the whole, the whole name of the game, the whole, the whole premise is we are inherently abundant without having to do or become or earn anything because we're a spark of the divine. We are divine. We are a manifestation of this all-powerful, infinite you know, fire of creation. And it's the fact that we kind of forgot that, that it's, it goes into, it goes into like, like 
like uh, like religion and monotheistic type of religions and stuff, where where this sort of empowerment, this awareness of our power has become very squashed and become, you know, we've been sort of brainwashed into becoming dependent on, on the church and things like that. I'm not going to get into all that, but the point is, you know, the way the world and humans have evolved is this awareness has sort of been, again, bred out of us in a sense. But now we're living in a time where it's starting and it's already been coming back for quite a while, hundreds of years even. Um, it's starting to finally come back, this awareness that life doesn't have to be so hard. We all are worthy and we all deserve abundance in whatever way that means for you. Maybe you absolutely love expensive, fast cars. That's like your genuine passion. You have no reason to feel guilty wanting a Ferrari. And some people say, he doesn't need a Ferrari or she doesn't. It doesn't matter. That's you. But you, maybe you're like, I don't, like, I don't care about cars, really. I like to travel. I like biohacking. You know, I have a sauna in my house. Some people think that's like this stupid luxury. But to me, that's abundance. What does abundance really look like for you? Now's the time when you might start to almost remember some of the truths in this book. And as I'm reading this book myself, I'm like, yeah, I've kind of been experiencing this. It's, it's not really news to me. It's not news to you. You don't have to get the book. This full moon is going to finally illuminate maybe some of your abundance blocks. Well, what is hanging you up? I'm a, I'm a coach. Also for, uh, for people who are starting a business, I teach people how to grow an online business. And it's a very common thing when you start to do that, when you start to say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a healer, I'm a psychic, I'm a coach, and I can help you and I'm gonna charge you money for my services. Usually at, at that point, even the thought of it brings up loads of abundance blocks, but this is good. This is good because just like those irrational fears I spoke about, your abundance blocks are probably just as irrational, just as silly, just as nonsensical. One of the things that really helped me about is sort of expanding my definition of abundance. You know, most people, they, they think of abundance as how much, what are the numbers next to your name in your Wells Fargo bank account or whatever. That's one very small form of abundance. But Bashar, a teacher I love, he's a channeler, says abundance is having what you need when you need it. Having what you need when you need it. And if you always have what you need when you need it, there's no anxiety. There's no abundance blocks. There's, there's, there's no fear. I remember when uh, about seven, eight years ago, I had this calling, this, this unshakable calling to pursue my dreams. And my dreams were to do what I'm doing now, to be on YouTube, talking to you. Um, but it seemed so crazy because it was not the right timing. I had three kids. They were real young. In fact, at the time I went for it, I literally just had my third baby. He was like days old when I was really contemplating this. And I had sort of a stable life on paper. I ran a personal training gym. I grew medical marijuana in my basement. I had made a decent income, had a nice house and a nice community. Um, and, and, but there was something missing. There was this, this feeling that there's another chapter I've yet to pursue in my life. It, and not only that, but it's time to do so. I sensed this new chapter was going to give me what I felt was missing, which is a, a deeper level of satisfaction, creative satisfaction, happiness, joy, passion. I knew was in this other direction. And anyway, long story short, <laughs> we decided in a very serious attempt to pursue this dream eventually, my family and I, where we sold our house, I sold my businesses, sold all of our belongings pretty much, except like maybe five, 10% of our belongings. We, got, we, we had a garage sale, we got rid of a lot of it, and we crammed our entire life, our entire family, three kids, two do a dog and a cat, my wife and I, into a 21-foot travel trailer, and we headed off to San Diego. That's where we wanted to go. And, you know, it, there are times living in that trailer, as you can imagine, in such a small space with, with uh, 
you know, your entire family. And I was at that time, wasn't really making any money. I was living off the money we made from the house and also credit card debt, basically. Um, and I look back at those times with always, it always brings a smile to my face. I look back with nostalgia because that wasn't a bad time in my life. Even though I had nothing, in fact, I always joke about, I had my wardrobe consisted of like a couple of pair of like sweatpants and I had uh, six shirts, three white t-shirts and three black t-shirts, all costing $6 each from H&M. I wore like $10 shoes from Walmart, <laughs> basically. And I, I, and I had like my little Kindle, cause I had to get rid of my books and a laptop, cause I worked and my phone to film videos. And that was like all I had. My kids didn't have rooms they had cubbies <laughs> and when they get in trouble, we'd say, go to your cubby we, and we'd shut the curtain. There was no door. There was a curtain. We shut the curtain, <laughs> you know, but we had what we needed when we needed it. And just when I got to the point where I ran out of money completely and maxed out my like five or six credit cards, I was in major credit card debt right at that exact period. What happened was. I got a bill from the IRS for $10,000 that I couldn't pay. And I thought, oh my God, I, I followed my calling out to, what am I gonna do? And in that exact spot in my life is when I got this idea to become a one-on-one -on -one coach. And because I had put so much energy into my YouTube channel by that point, I was able to fill up with clients within a week. And within a week, even though things look so p bad, we never actually went without. And in the perfect, just brilliant timing of the universe, I was able to sort of climb back up financially in, in, in the realm of abundance. But the whole journey, we were led. It was always kind of obvious what to do. As crazy as it sounds, selling our stuff and moving into an RV was like the logical thing. It was like this very clear idea, like this is what we're gonna do. And not only we're we gonna do it, but it's super exciting to us. It wasn't like a bad thing. It wasn't a downgrade, even though to everybody else, it looks like one on paper. I've been abundant. I was abundant in those at that time. You're abundant now. And when you start to wake up to your abundance and reframe your definition of abundance, it starts to actually materialize more so in like money and things like on a practical level. But if we're going to really do that, what's very important is to know that just your connection to your inner being, your higher self, your spirit, your soul is abundance. Many people are completely severed off and they don't even know they're severed off. They're going through life controlled purely by those irrational fears, by their just their ego intellect. intellect. They're not making conscious choices and therefore their life is on a decline, most people. If you're watching this video, if you're into this even a little bit, I can guarantee you, you have a very strong connection to your inner self. And that is abundance. That's all you need. And now it's a matter of getting the fears, putting them in their place, which should be way out of the picture because they don't make any sense. And finally listening boldly, faithfully, courageously to that party that's been trying to tell you what to do and where to go and how to live this entire time. And once you start doing that, you are, you will, you will get what you need when you need it. That's at least been my experience. I made a choice back in 2016. I'm going to finally, in fact, that was my whole hang up. I got to a point in my life where I literally knew that you have been on this spiritual journey a long time and now it's time to start living it. You want to be a YouTuber? Well, guess what? You have to live it. You're not living it, Victor. You're clinging on out of fear. And I knew it to the gym and to the grow and things like that. I knew I, if I was to really, it was just time to really own it and live a life of faith. Not just talk about it, not just read about it, but when it comes time to those hard choices, living by faith and not fear. And this is the time to do that. This is the time you can make that exact pivot, that life changing choice right here, right now in this exact moment, the full moon is going to encourage you, it's going to support you. And I bet it even shows you that you are good, you are protected, you are safe to do so. Thirdly, it's a great time 
to learn, which we all have to, if we're honest with ourselves, to learn mature conflict resolution. We are in an energy right now, for one, approaching the full moons, which tend to make people emotional, but also we are like just coming off a very powerful and highly anticipated eclipse season. So the point is the collective, you, me, everybody, pretty much is emotional right now. Our emotions are stronger. They're more potent. Not only that is the energy on the planet, as many of you know, is changing. And not only are we more emotional, but a lot of our lower emotions, the ones that we at one time could su successfully repress, are now coming up. And because this is happening with most people, even if you keep trying to suppress it, it it's, it's coming out. <clears throat> it can make for a lot of uh, sudden, emotionally charged like conversations and, and relationship conflicts and challenges that just sort of come in. You know, no one can no one can bite their tongue anymore, basically. And it's, it's very difficult sometimes to not react to these types of energies within your close or, you know, intermediate relationships. And a lot of times, because you're also, we're also becoming more aware, when you see somebody sort of acting out towards you egoically from their own unconsciousness, it has this type of, uh, you might feel like, like, I don't deserve this. This is, this is not right. This, I, I'm not going to put up with this. Um, anyway, the point is, in spite of this like difficulty of maybe like getting sucked into the drama energy out there in your life, people, etc., there's also this, at least for me, I'm experiencing it. I'm going to share with you in case you are as well. There's this sort of feeling that not, this might be the situation, but it's also a time to really be cool with people regardless. Mature conflict resolution. You know, sometimes we can feel so justified in react in our reactions. But after the fact, you know if that was the right move by how you feel in your heart. I'm reading this other book, really cool book. What's it called? Uh, Gather Together Around Me or something by uh, Maya Angelou. She's an amazing, amazing writer. It's one of her autobiographies. And she is a woman who grew up in like the 30s in Stamps, Arkansas. And she in, encountered a level of discrimination. Uh, you know, she was an African-American woman that is just it's appalling to read about, honestly. And it's sad that people are so ignorant, but and these, these innocent people had to like put up with such bullshit, basically. But anyway, she grew up and she, she dealt with, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the discrimination. But eventually she moved out to San, Diego, or, uh, San Francisco and lived with her, her actual mother. And in San Francisco, she kind of came into her power. She started to realize just how smart she is. And she really, she had a bunch of cool like jobs she kind of created for herself. And anyway, she came back to Arkansas one time, you know, when she was older, by, by now in her power, still kind of weary of white people and to her own defense. I don't blame her whatsoever. Um, and anyway, she was in a grocery store one time or a, 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 like a, a clothing store. And this, and she was like, she was like trying to pass through like the, those like doors when you walk in, those double doors. She was like running into this woman and the woman would like not get out of her way. And she was like, oh, excuse me. You know, she tried to walk around and the woman like wouldn't get out of her way and said something. I forgot what it was. Just very rude, very condescending. And Maya now finally in her power and like, you know, with all that kind of, you know, all of her experience kind of culminating, she finally was in a position where she could finally like stick up for herself. And she did. I forgot what she said, but it was very <laughs> articulate, but also kind of penetrating and equally insulting. But anyway, she felt very justified. This woman sort of wronged her. She had her whole past kind of influencing her. Anyway. She walked away from this engagement so proud of herself. She was like, finally, I freaking... She even, in the book, she describes how like the grass was greener, the, the sun shone brighter, and you know, things like that. She, she kind of walked home with this, like her head held high, feeling very proud of what she did. And she was telling her grandma, who she calls mama, this like really cool, this really cool, like uh, this like hip woman. And she was like, mama, guess what happened? And she was telling mama, and mama was listening and listening. You know what mama did? Mama slapped her right in the head. 
And then Maya was like, why would you do that? Boom, another slap, another slap. <laughs> Mama didn't like that. Mama was not impressed. Mama was like a really a old school, true Christian who really lived by the principles. You don't succumb you don't let other people's unconsciousness lure you down to their level is sort of the sentiment I gleaned from, from mama's re response there. It doesn't matter if you feel justified. It doesn't matter what they did. Who are you? Do you want to conduct yourself in that way? And it's hard sometimes. I've, I've had it so many times. I'm sure you have too. When you've been genuinely wronged. When, when like someone did something to you that you did not deserve and you know that there's, there's, there's no way, it's not just about your perspective. It was not called for and yet it happened to you. How do you not react? I think it's something we're learning. I think it's something we're feeling called to do. It's a good time to do that. And, and how else are things going to change? How else is the world going to change if somebody doesn't do it? Why wouldn't it be you? Why wouldn't it be someone who's into spirituality, who's on this sort of spiritual awakening path, who's coming into more of an awareness of their actual divine qualities, which we all possess? How else are other people going to see their own if you don't demonstrate it? Lastly, my friends, this is going to be the most out there one, I'll, I'll warn you. But I wrote down here, the return of innocence, the return of your in a sense, this is like probably the deepest thing maybe happening right now at this really unique full moon time. And what I mean by that is that it is said by a psychoanalyst, Jungian, Carl Jungian uh, analyst in particular, that most human beings at a very young age, zero to five, experience what they call the split. A split is where we experience something that our, our open, impressionable, innocent self is unable to sort of metabolize, you could say, psych psychologically. But because we're little kids, we can't really actually escape you know, our upbringing, the unconsciousness of our parents, etc. There's this like ad adapt adaptation we go through where we take a part of ourselves, our soul, our innocent, and we sort of hide it in the deep recesses of our psyche. This is like the split. A part of us does leave, does vacate, does disassociate, they call it. And then this other part of us, the protector part, the part of ourselves that doesn't want to experience whatever that feeling was ever again, starts to kind of change and, and a, a sort of adapt itself. And from this sort of split off position, most people grow up thinking they're not enough, thinking they need to overcompensate for their not enoughness in whatever that looks like, thinking they need to resort to unhealthy means of bringing in love and support and nurturing. And also, anyway, you go through a spiritual awakening or what Carl Jung calls the individuation process, and you start to realize this is kind of happening. You start to catch yourself acting from this protector self. You also start to feel and sense there's something very important missing. You just can't quite put your finger on it. It's this part of you, your innocence, your creativity, your soul that at one point you decided it wasn't safe here for you. And yet this split leaves us miserable. It leaves us chasing our own soul in money and social media status and all these different things, food. And we're getting to a point where you might start to realize that there is something missing. And it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. There's something missing. I went through this recently, but I was like, man, I've, I've gotten to a great place in my life where I pretty much have everything I could have ever dreamed of, but there's something missing. There's, there's, there's an important piece of the puzzle completely absent from my life. What? And I didn't know what it was. And then you know what I did? And I mentioned earlier, this relates to you. Don't worry. I picked up the guitar. I picked up a hobby that is not going to get me anywhere. It's not going to do anything at all for my self image. I, I'm not very good at all right now. Any guitarists know it's not easy to, you know, it takes a while. But when I play that guitar, 
time just slips away and I feel exactly like I felt when I was a little kid playing. And when I was a child, they used to draw. I'd listen to rock and roll music and I would draw. And there was just this feeling of like pointless fun, I would say, that I felt that is now being reintroduced to my life because finally little Victor feels safe to come back. Carl Jung, sort of the, one of the original pioneer thinkers along this vein, he spent a good, I think, one or a few years building sandcastles, <laughs> believe it or not, on the, on the beach of one of his, his, like this house he built and he would go out there for hours and build freaking sandcastles because he was going through this exact same thing where he also sensed something was missing. He had this impressive awareness that it was his innocence, his inner child, if you will. And he found that when he engaged in things that brought back that childlike joy and play, it was bringing, it was almost like calling back. It's okay to come back now, little Vic. It's okay to come back now, little inner child. Come on back. So it's a great time to do that. So I ask you, my friend, do you have a hobby? Is there something you could be doing that will bring you an almost pointless joy just for the sake of it? Know this, Carl Jung didn't build sandcastles because he wanted to do something with that in his life. He was already a very well-known psychologist, author. He was doing well for himself. He didn't need the sandcastles for his self-image for his life, for his security. He did it because it was a spiritual practice, a very powerful and transformative one at that. And also, and I can say this now from direct experience as of the last two weeks, playing guitar, it's worth it for the sake of it. It's worth it, my friend, just to have fun. It has brought me a whole new dimension to my life that has been missing for a very long time and I feel so grateful. And I hope that you can find yourself a hobby if you don't already have one as well. Finally, it's a great time to do your part. Here's the thing. Most people along their spiritual journey go through a point where they start to become aware that there's something here on earth they came to do. There's something they came to offer. There's some way in which they're capable of helping the whole in some way. And this sort of crossroad, this, this, this point is a very, it can last a long time for people. We tend to put it off. It's very scary to do this. It's very scary because what if we don't do it right? What if we mess it up? What if we're mistaken and this really isn't our calling? People won't really like it or whatever. Or what if you're busy? What if you're like, I don't got time for this purpose business. I have a family. I have a family to feed here. I have things going on in my life. I don't have time. I can't do it. It's not fair to... It's not going to work. But as you know, if you relate to this, that feeling doesn't go away, does it? It still is it's persistent. Yes, there is something you came to do. Yes, you do need to do it anyways. In spite of your fears, in spite of your life circumstance, you still need to do it. There's that part of you trying to pull you into it. And now is a great time to finally go for it. To finally do it. This happened to me just yesterday. I found myself not really... Normally, the way I write, the way I do these updates, if you want to know, I have like my phone and I will notice things in my life that, uh, that kind of like stick out to me. That's how I, my, it's like an intuitive thing where I'm like, ah, oh, this is, I want to share this. I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this. Just things that pop out to me. And when I get to five, I make my five things videos. And as of yesterday, I was at like three and I know I was getting close. I don't normally edit my own videos. I'm going to do it today because I'm on a crunch time. So I was like, ah, it's just not time. I don't, I don't really, it's just, it hasn't really been coming to me. And I don't have the time really to get it to my editor and back and have all this stuff done to, to have it out in time. So I was planning on not doing it, long story short. 
But then, as I mentioned earlier, if you remember, I was at this live event yesterday supporting my friend Aaron and my wife Patty actually played a song for all these people. And I was there just kind of hanging out, watching them, supporting. And this woman, this really cool woman came up to me and she was just so excited to meet me. She was like, oh, Victor. She was just genuinely excited. And she says, I watch all your videos and I look forward to them. They're so helpful to me. And she was like, you know, sharing with me just different things I said that I completely forgotten about that she remembered and were impactful to her. And in that one little encounter, it made me remember that for me anyway, the numbers next to my YouTube channel account represent actual people, people out there in the world living lives, people with families, people with hopes and fears and dreams and concerns and struggles that I can help with. It's not about whether I feel like it or not. Oh, oh, big deal, Vic, you have to edit your own video. What do you freaking do? You got an obligation, bro. So here I am, basically. And it was a great reminder, a great reminder that it's not about me. There's a million reasons not to do something that your mind can very effortlessly conjure up. But none of them, in my opinion, are strong enough to outweigh that feeling telling you, you know what is right. You know, a lot of you now know what you came to do. It's now it's a matter of doing it. So anyways, I just wanted to share that. I'm very happy I made this video. I'm very happy to have had that reminder, which I still sometimes need as well, obviously. And maybe this can be yours. That it's time to do what you came to do, my friend. And with that said, I'm going to leave you with this. If you still feel stuck, if, if after this video, you still feel like, yeah, I hear you, Vic. This is all very helpful, but I'm still a mess. I still feel blocked. I still feel stuck. Then I'm going to share with you something that I'm going to offer. Um, that I'm going to share with you something I think will help. It's called a somatic release breathwork ceremony. These are things I put on for thousands of people. I normally charge money for them. It's a real powerful, deep uh, transformative experience. But for today, I'm going to leave a link down below. And if you want, you can get it for free. It's going to be a replay of one I've already done. Um, but you can just sort of pop it on and listen to it. It's like an hour long and it will take you into a very deep transformative process where you can release pent up stuck emotions and gain clarity on your purpose, on your path by connecting more so with your soul, your higher self. And I know that sounds abstract, but it's true because the breathing pattern releases DMT in your brain. And uh, it's a very, very powerful experience I'm going to offer you if you want, if you, if you feel you need it. I'll leave a link down below. Check it out. And with that said, have an amazing day, my friends. Hope you're doing great. And I'll be in touch soon. Peace.